Okay, thank you very much for that gracious introduction, Luca, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Luca said, uh, uh, we've been asked to talk about Africa's security trends. And this is a challenging task since Africa has as varied a set of security challenges as any region in the world. In fact, on our website at the Africa Center, we track some 20 different security topics that uh, face African countries uh, around the continent. And so to help facilitate our discussion, I'd like to invite you to imagine an African village with five different uh, African farmers. The first farmer is what I call the steady farmer. You know, he's a hardworking, solid farmer, very diligent. Um, he and his family track the weather very carefully. Uh, they know when to plant. They're out there men, uh, tending to their crops, weeding, protecting them against pests pest and predators. And when it comes time to harvest, they, they generate a, a bountiful harvest, which they then manage uh, well, so that they have enough uh, food supplies to last them through the year, past the hungry time, and they have seeds again to plant uh, in the new season. Uh, this type of farmer uh, has challenges, but by and large, he's able to, to work them out. Sometimes when there are jobs that require more resources than he has, he will work collectively with his other neighbors. They'll join labor and, uh, and get the job done. So this type of farmer represents the majority of African countries, in my view. While we spend most of our time in the security realm talking about the 12 or so African countries that are facing um, armed conflict, in fact, the vast majority, 42 countries, are not facing uh, armed conflict uh, at this time. And while these countries face their share of security challenges, they're relatively stable. And there's a strong governance feature to this stability. Um, specifically, those uh, governments that are more inclusive, inclusive and participatory tend to be more stable. Of the 12 countries that are facing armed conflict, 10 are categorized as not free by the Freedom House uh, Index on Governance. Conversely, of the 42 that aren't in conflict, only 25% are um, categorized as not free. In this pattern we see uh, unfolding internally as well. Uh, when you look at the next generation of African security professionals, uh, including many of you, we see that new recruits into the services um, are better educated, they're older, and they're expressing a greater commitment to service and professionalism than what we've seen in previous generations. Moreover, this group of countries has demonstrated a commitment to collective security. Today, there are some 80,000 African soldiers, policemen, or civilians participating in peacekeeping missions, whether UN or African Union. Uh, and they come from 33 different countries across the continent. 15 years ago, there were only 10,000 African peacekeepers. The second type of farmer that I would uh, ask you to consider is the farmer with a weak immune system. So we all know people like this that anytime there's a cold going around, they're the ones who are going to get sick. You know, they're suffering from other, other viruses, you know, malaria, dysentery, pneumonia, whatever it is. They tend to come down with it. Um, this farmer lives in the same village as the first type of farmer. But um, because their immune system is weak, they don't have the same resistance 
And so they um, are out of commission more often. And as a result, he and his family are not able to go out to the farm as often. They aren't able to take care of their crops as well. Um, and as a result, their harvest isn't quite as good. And, and they end up having to struggle over the course of the year to manage their food supplies. This in turn affects their nutrition, which further weakens uh, their immunity. So this second category of farmer, I would suggest, represents African countries without a strong national identity or sense of unity. You know, this is a weak national immunity system. And it recognizes that nearly all of Africa's conflicts are internally based. They're coming from within the, society, the, from within the societies, uh, not from outside. And they're often based on uh, forms of political exclusion, whether based on ethnicity, religion, geographic region, or political party. And these divisions then create uh, divergences within the society and, and grievances. The grievances in turn um, foster tensions that can be ignited and, and turn into conflict. Um, these internal conflicts are also typified by non-state actors. So you're typically not facing standing armies. Um, and so these um, insurgent groups or rebels, um, they, they aren't necessarily militarily strong, but because the government is weak, um, they're able to sustain a high level of instability for some time. Moreover, because the government doesn't enjoy a lot of trust from the population, um, they have trouble to mobilize support to deal with these problems. And moreover, um, we see that when there is a lack of trust in not only government leaders, but in the security sector in particular, and, in, and, and including the justice sector, there is a higher tendency for violence in these societies. And the interpretation is that when people believe they can't trust in the institutions that are created to protect them or to provide justice, if they feel they're not going to be treated fairly, then they feel more justified in taking up arms to protect themselves uh, or to pursue their own interest. And so when you, you know, it, it contributes to a higher level of violence in these societies. Moreover, we see that when these societal divisions are not addressed, these problems don't go away. The, the instability doesn't fizzle out. Instead, it tends to grow and, and become worse. And one metric of this is the number of displaced people we see on the continent. Today, there are 12.7 million internally displaced people in Africa. This is a 65% increase since just 2013. If we consider refugees as well, it's 22 million uh, people. And interestingly, and relevant to the fact that it's a very um, uh, non-uniform uh, set of uh, security threats on the continent, 75% of these 22 million uh, displaced people come from just five countries. Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And these problems, you know, these, these countries didn't just have a conflict in the last year that's been going on for some time. And because it doesn't get addressed, instability continues in, the, in those countries as well as it spreads to neighbors uh, within the region. All right, the third type of conflict, um, or I'm sorry, the third type, third type of farmer I would... Uh, I would like to talk about is, is the big man. All right. Uh, in our village, this is the farmer who's very smart. He's a smooth talker. And he uh, manages to get elected to the local farmers' cooperative. 
And in this position, he realizes because the accounting structures for this local cooperative are not that good, you know, he's able to siphon off some of the revenues and use it for his own personal interest. Uh, and so as a result, you know, he, he was able to buy a new four-wheel drive vehicle. He was able to help some of his friends. He's often at parties. There are many, you know, beautiful women that um, are around all the time. And he gets used to this lifestyle. Uh, and when it comes time for him to end his term, he doesn't want to leave. This is, this is, you know, this is a good life, the way he sees it. And so he, you know, realizing that the, you know, again, the, the institutions that regulate the cooperative are not that uh, developed, he's able to um, massage the process so that he's able to stay on in power past his allotted term and, uh, and, and then continue in that position. However, more of the villages see this, and they're not happy. And so it starts to stir up trouble within the village. So this type of farmer um, reflects leaders who refuse to abide by the two-term limit in Africa. Um, and there are important governance implications to this. So there are 10 countries where there were term, term limits established and African leaders were able to evade them through one means or another. And we see that in these 10 countries, the leaders have been in power on average for about 21 years. In comparison, there's 18 countries where term limits are being maintained and the average time in office for the leaders in those countries is 3.5 years. So there are very long-term implications from this. Moreover, some of the worst political crises that have turned into conflict that we see uh, on the continent are from just this type of problem. So of, of the 10 leaders uh, who have evaded lim term limits, three are facing uh, severe uh, political crises that have been in conflict. But I would argue that the other seven are also facing instability. While it seems stable on the outside, there's a boiling uh, resentment that's growing. And they too are uh, in a precarious position. So this class of countries reflects uh, the case where the rule of the individual is stronger than the rule of the law. All right, the fourth type of farmer I would call the family man. This family is known for his large and growing family. In fact, he has uh, a dozen children, half of whom are uh, under the age of 18. And over the years, he's been able to provide for uh, all of his family well. However, as his children have grown and as per his local tradition, he wants to gift some of his land to his older children so they can start their own families and have their own farms. But he's finding that as he does this, the parcels of land that he has to divide are growing smaller and smaller. And so he's unable to, he and his family are unable to provide the same amount of food as they used to. And the soil fertility is going down, they're having environmental problems. Um, and so they're, they're struggling more. And as a result, some of his children have moved to the city to look for work. Um, other children have migrated out of the country, trying to find jobs where they can send remittances um, back home. So this type of farmer represents um, the demographic dynamics that are unfolding on the continent. Africa is the youngest um, continent or the youngest region in the world with an average age of 25. 70% of the population is under the age of 30. 
Um, the estimated population of 1.2 billion today is expected to be 1.6 billion in 2030 and 2.4 billion in 2050. And this population is rapidly urbanizing. Um, African cities are growing at a rate of about 15 to 18 million a year. And by 2025, we expect that a majority of African citizens will be living in urban areas. And unfortunately, because many of the people who are going to the cities don't have jobs, and the governments haven't planned for their influx, uh, they're living in um, what are called unplanned settlements, um, or, or shanty towns, or, or slums, which are lightly governed. You know, there aren't many services there. And so it has, pr has provided an opportunity from a security standpoint for gangs or criminal or organizations um, to fill the gap and to assert their influence. Sometimes these groups are connected to um, political actors within their country. Um, sometimes these groups will try to co-opt political actors or departments within the government so they can assert more uh, of their influence. Um, so it's a new security challenge that is evolving. Likewise, with large numbers of young men densely populated in national capitals, there's a greater risk that these individuals could be mobilized um, towards uh, ends that will be destabilizing. So it's a different type of threat to stability than has been seen previously. All right, the fifth and final type of farmer that I would uh, ask you to consider is the marginalized farmer. And this is the farmer who lives with his household out on the outskirts of the village. Several, you know, it's, it's a long walk back to the center of the village. And um, this farmer is, is, is Muslim and he, he tends to cattle rather than uh, raises crops like the other farmers. They tend to be poorer than their other villagers. And because there aren't as many services on the outskirts, um, he's not able to send his children to school as much or to get them to a clinic when they're sick. Um, and in recent years, the villagers have noticed that, uh, especially some of the youth from this farmer's family, is tending to uh, show the influences of uh, other forms of Islam. That um, before they used to be very well integrated and they would attend each other's weddings and funerals, now they seem to be more exclusive and confrontational. Um, and in fact, sometimes some of the young, young men are bringing weapons into the center of the village which is causing anxieties. So this type of farmer reflects the growing influence of militant Islamist ideologies um, across the continent in various Muslim communities. And ideologies that are by and large being promoted from outside the continent, typically from the Gulf, and being uh, promulgated through satellite TV and internet, but more directly through funding of local mosques and madrasas and Muslim youth centers and, and clubs. And uh, with it, um, they are being exposed to a more ultra-conservative interpretation, and I, and I would add an Arab-based interpretation of Islam that is um, uh, changing how they look at the religion. It's contributing to intergenerational differences uh, within these communities and uh, a gradual radicalization of, um, of the view of religion. And this has contributed to the fact that we now have 25 militant Islamist groups on the continent located in nine different countries, mostly in the Sahel, Maghreb, or the Horn. Um, yet there are 15 other countries that are also dealing with issues of radicalization that hasn't yet um, uh, turned into uh, or emerged in, into mil militant, militant Islamist groups. 
Um, and so it's a, it's a growing pattern that um, is also affecting our village. So while this is just a simple representation, our village here reflects the multi-layered and multi-dimensional uh, aspects of security in Africa today. And while some of the factors I've described are coming from outside the continent, by and large, the key drivers are coming from inside. And they're often governance related, often having to do with forms of exclusion or, or lack of legitimacy. And so as we think about um, security strategies moving forward, we have to think about how governance factors into these security strategies. Traditional military strategies and solutions aren't going to suffice for the types of challenges that, that the village is facing. Um, and rather than thinking about traditional military battles, we should be thinking about battles for trust of the population. And this and, and the security sector will have a key part of this. So the way that security sectors engage citizens um, will have long-term implications for whether trust and unity um, is built or whether it is further frayed and leads to greater fragmentation and instability down the road. So with that, let me stop and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.